Daivat, by the destiny of the conditioned souls. Kshubhita, agitated. Dharminyam, whose equilibrium of uh, sorry, whose equilibrium of the modes. Svasyam, his own. Yo now, in the womb, material nature. Parak Puma Hare Krishna. The sum total of cosmic intelligence. Known as Hiranmaya. So, translation by Srila Prabhupada. After the Supreme Personality of Godhead impregnates material nature with his internal potency, Material nature delivers the sum total of the cosmic intelligence, which is known as Hiranmaya. This takes place. This takes place in material nature when she is agitated by the destinations of the conditioned souls. So please repeat. After the supreme personality of Godhead impregnates material nature with his internal potency, material nature delivers the sum total of the cosmic intelligence, which is known as Hiranmaya. This takes place in material nature when she is agitated by the destinations of the conditioned souls. Srila Prabhupada's purport for this verse. This impregnation of material nature is described in Bhagavad Gita, 14th chapter, verse 3. Material nature's primal factor is the Mahatattva, or breeding source of all varieties. This part of material nature, which is called Pradhan, as well as Brahman, is impregnated by the Supreme Personality of Godhead and delivers varieties of living entities. Material nature in this connection is called Brahman because it is a perverted reflection of the spiritual nature. It is described in the Vishnu Purana that the living entities belong to the spiritual nature. The potency of the Supreme Lord is spiritual, and the living entities, although they are called marginal potency, are also spiritual. If the living entities were not spiritual, this description of impregnation by the Supreme Lord would not be applicable. The Supreme Lord does not put his semen into that which is not spiritual. But it is stated here that the Supreme Person puts his semen into material nature. This means that the living entities are spiritual by nature. After impregnation, material nature delivers all kinds of living entities, 
beginning from the greatest living creature, Lord Brahma, down to the insignificant ant in all varieties of form. In Bhagavad Gita 14.4, material nature is clearly mentioned as Sarva Yonishu. This means that of all varieties of species, demigods, human beings, animals, birds and beasts, whatever is manifested, material nature is the mother, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the seed-giving father. Generally, it is experienced that the father gives life to the child, but the mother gives its body. Although the seed of life is given by the father, the body develops within the womb of the mother. Similarly, the spiritual living entities are impregnated into the womb of material nature, but the body, being supplied by material nature, takes on many different species and forms of life. The theory that the symptoms of life are manifest by the interaction of the 24 material elements is not supported herein. It's an important sentence. The theory, which is also called physicalism in modern terms, the theory that the symptoms of life are manifest by the interaction of the 24 material elements is not supported here. The living force comes directly from the Supreme Personality of Godhead and is completely spiritual. Therefore, no material scientific advancement can produce life. The living force comes from the spiritual world and has nothing to do with the interaction of the material elements. So, translation again. After the Supreme Personality of Godhead impregnates material nature with his internal potency, material nature delivers the sum total of the cosmic intelligence, which is known as Hiran Maya. This takes place in material nature when she is agitated by the destinations of the conditioned souls. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakayak Shakshur Unmilitam Jaina Tasmai Shigurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stavitam Yu Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Yam Dadati Svapatantikam Vancha Kalpaturubhis Chakripas Indu Bhyayva Chapatita Nam Pavani Bhyo Vaishna Vibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadar Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We have to be convinced. Well, first of all, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for those of you tolerating me and those online also watching. Glory to your effort to listen to Srimad Bhagavatam in the middle of the materialistic surrounding where you find yourselves. Thank you. As I was saying, um, we have to be convinced that life comes from life. A famous statement by Prabhupada, right? Life comes from life. And we just, we have to be convinced of that. When reading over, preparing this verse, I was um, thinking back in my early years of Krishna consciousness when I was living in the ashram in the ISKCON Los Angeles temple. And there, I associated with Brigupati Prabhu. Some of you book distributors may know of him. He's a famous, you know, book distributor in Los Angeles. Um, and Jutta Karma Prabhu, also the author of Human Devolution, which I'll read a paragraph or two from in a few minutes, was also living there. And, you know, I, I hung out, I associated with these devotees, and both of them, especially Brigupati Prabhu, was sort of spiritually obsessed with specifically the the the, the s research on children who claim to remember their past lives i don't know if names like ian stevenson jim tucker ring a bell ian stevenson died about 10 15 years ago but he was like the the world authority and the first world authority on on the actual academic study you know under rigorous scientific rules and criteria of the phenomena of children all over the world who, you know, supposedly, allegedly, are remembering a past life. 
And so I remember, like, Brigu Patipu would tell me, like, Chandra Shekhar, you have to read this book. So he would, like, force me to read, you know, a book by Ian Stevenson, like, for example, where biology and reincarnation in intersect. And then he would, you know, force me to read uh, Jutta Karma Prabhu's book a little bit later, where, you know, Jutta Karma Prabhu presents the, the Vedic understanding of, of consciousness and, and who humans are. So I have that, you know, in my in my sort of brain, in my as, as some scars, you know, as impressions, this sort of obsession or concern or not of concern but interest in um, in children who remember their past lives. And why is this relevant to today's verse? It's relevant to today's verse because it has to do with who the self is. And it's something that concerns all of us. You know, maybe none of, maybe some of us have not studied, you know, or have a hobby about studying children who remember their past lives or um, out-of-body experiences or, you know, um, near-death experiences or, you know, yogic powers of this type or that type as described more and more in, in, in scientific um, documentation. But all of us, devotee or not devotee are concerned, or should be at least, with the question of who am I? Who, who am I? Who is the self? What is the self, right? I mean, not many people are interested in this question, and especially in today's society, especially now with social media and, you know, the likes of TikTok and so on, the, the, the human attention span is, is, is reduced to like, you know, 1.2 seconds. <laughs> and so, it reminds me, Rida Inanamaraj, one of my Shiksha gurus, he describes, you know, the modern civilization is like hydro, uh, hydroplaning. You know the boats that go really fast on lakes? They go so fast that technically they're not even touching the ocean surface. And that's how kind of like modern man is. We're not even, you know, touching Earth. We're just, you know, hydroplaning with just a million five hundred distractions at every single second, you know. So the question, who am I, what is the self, doesn't, doesn't even register, unfortunately, how sad the state of, of affairs is. But it's a, it's a question that, you know, should um, concern all of us, and, and this is, you know, the, the theme of, of this verse. Like, what is actually the self? There's another famous scientist, his name is Marvin Minsky. I don't know if he's still alive, but he used to, he was famous for great advances in computer science. And, and he would say that we are meat computers. Meat computers. So just imagine a computer just made of flesh, and that's, you know, he would claim that's who we are. We are meat computers, right? But, but, but the Bhagavatam is saying, no, we are not meat computers. You know, we are not meat computers. Let me read to you Dr. Karma Prabhu's few paragraphs from his really cool book, Human Devolution, which I recommend, you know, we read, where he describes, you know, what we have accepted as our, you know, definition of what the self actually is. So this is from chapter um, 6, where he's establishing that, you know, we are the soul, basically. Oh no, I lost it, Prabhu's. I have to go to the introduction. This is worth, please wait, because this is, you know, it's really worth it. Just a few seconds here. What is a human being? Matter, mind, and consciousness. Here we go. So it's just a few, the f first few paragraphs. All right. Actually, I have it written here. Excuse me. No. Ah. When we consider all the evidence available to science, he says, we find ample justification for basing, basing our study of human origins on the assumption, so here's the assumption, that a human being 
or any other living entity of our ordinary experience is composed of not just one thing, ordinary matter, so we're not, you know, meat computers, but of three things, matter, mind, and consciousness, or spirit. Now, as apprentices, in Western philosophy of science, there's this, you know, mind-body duality that's been, you know, influencing us for, for centuries, coming from Descartes, if I'm not mistaken, where, you know, the mind is, quote-unquote, spiritual, and the body is material. But we, as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, or followers of the Bhagavad philosophy, claim, no, no, that actually the mind, even the mind itself, is still material. Consciousness is actually different from the mind, right? So let me read a few sentences here. By mind, he says, I mean a subtle material energy, it's material, connected with the human organism and capable of influencing ordinary matter or receiving sensory impressions in ways unexplained by the laws of science as currently accepted. Listen to this one. Mind is not, however, conscious, although it may carry content for consciousness and may be in part instrumental for translating conscious intentions into action in the world of ordinary matter. See? So the mind is another body. It just it carries consciousness. And, and consciousness is who we are. We're the soul, according to the Bhagavatam. By spirit, I mean a conscious, experiencing, desiring, acting self that can exist apart from mind and matter. Right. Can you repeat the last yes, it's 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 nice summary. By spirit, I mean a conscious, experiencing, desiring, acting self that can exist apart from mind and matter. We have a story in the Bhagavatam. I forget which canto, but there was a sage. He was so like Krishna conscious. He 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 he. he died, I mean, he, you know, his bo- he loved his body, and, he f- and, it, and later on he's like, oh, where's my body? Like he forgot that he had <laughs> left his body, the Bhagavatam described, you know. So th- the self can exist, and that's why, you know, studies on children, for example, who claim to remember their past lives is so relevant for us, because it seems to present empirical evidence, indeed, that there is a conscious self that survives the death experience. Right, the the, the 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 self is surviving physical death. The body is destroyed, buried, burnt, and somehow or other, there's someone in some other body subsequent to that one who remembers specific details of the character, the belongings, the properties, the relationships, the language, etc., of the prior identity or the prior person. Right. Now. Let me play for you a one-minute clip to show the contrast of what we're being bombarded with in modern civilization on this topic of who is the self. Have any one of you heard of this Jewish guy called Professor Yuval Harari? Harari is, is, is he's a contemporary, and he shows up a lot in, um, in discussions on you know, the, the, the attempt or the alleged attempt to establish, a, you know, a worldwide, uh, 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 you know, digital ID passport for all human beings, you know, via things like the COVID pandem- uh, pandemic and stuff like that. And at one point, you know, he's, so he's really a hot item today because he's the one who claims, as you'll see, he's exactly stating, just listen to him. I'll put the microphone to him. I'll put the, the video to him and, and listen to the last minute one minute later, he talks about free will and love and you know freedom of choice, and and listen carefully to what he says. But some gov- governments and corporations, for the first time in history, have the power to basically hack human beings. Right, hacking human beings. That's what he's talking about. You know, you, you can hack a computer. So now the idea is that, you know, now you'll be able to hack the human machine, right? 
There is a lot of talk about hacking computers, hacking smartphones, hacking bank accounts, but the big story of our era is the ability to hack human beings. And by this I mean that if you have enough data and you have enough computing power, you can understand people better than they understand themselves, mm -hmm. and then you can manipulate them in ways which were previously impossible. Mm -hmm. And in such a situation, the old democratic system stopped functioning. We need to reinvent democracy for this new era in which humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. We need to come to terms with the fact that, you know what, again, it, this is where philosophy meets computer science and biology. So that's over. So, so he claims, you know, free will, all that is over. Why? Because, because of algorithms that can, you know, tell and kind of foretell every one of our buying choices and what we do in life and so on. What to speak of, you know, maybe implants of microchips that, you know, upload bio data to, to some server. Because of that, we can influence. We cannot just know humans better than they know themselves, but we can influence them, you know. And okay, that sounds real convincing, but actually it's not when you uh, uh, confront it to the Vedic paradigm, because there's one key, really key core element that's missing in Mr. Har Harari's, you know, discussion here. And what is that? It's what, you know, one of these early books on, on from the Bhaktivedanta Institute called The Missing Link. Consciousness, right? This idea, again, as Prabhupada describes in the purport to this verse, that consciousness is not a product of, of matter. It's not a product of matter. It never was and it never will be a product of matter. Right? And so therefore, because it's not a product of matter, you can't control it. And that, 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 that's, that's good news. That's really good news. You know, imagine, otherwise, you know, become just slaves to some algorithms. No, never pop, because ultimately you can't, you know, you, God, I remember there was this hip-hop or rap singer in the 1980s, I think his name was MC Hammer. <laughs> this is not part of my preparation of my class, but, you know, he used to have this song called You Can't Touch This. <laughs> there you go. You're in Maya, no, I'm kidding. You Can't Touch This. Uh, this is a sort of a, Kali, um, a perverted, refle you know, a degraded version of Plato's you know, drinking the hemlock. Go ahead, kill me, because you can't really touch me. Socrates, excuse me. Socrates, you can't kill me. You know, I'm I'm the soul. You can't. You can't. You can do whatever you want with the body, but you can't touch me, right? And uh, uh, listen to listen to this. Francis Crick. You know who Francis Crick is the guy very responsible for for the whole, um, you know, p mapping out the DNA of of human beings. He says this, listen to this. Same thing as Harari. Your joy, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity, and your free will, hmm, the famous free will, are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. And therefore, since it's matter, we can control matter, we can you know, put it into some algorithm and we can control it. Uh-uh. Excuse me. Not. Right? Krishna. Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, right? Aparayam itas tvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yayedam dharyate jagat. Right? He talks about matter and he says, besides matter, besides this inferior nature, O mighty armed Arjuna, there is a superior energy of mine which are all living entities who are struggling with the material nature and are sustaining the universe, right? So Krishna establishes in, in black and white that uh, the, 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 the higher energy, energy is actually the soul jiva bhuta, 
right? Aparayam isvatanyam prakritim vidhi me param. Beyond prakriti param, there's the jiva, the jiva bhuta, the embodied soul, and, and that is made of spirit. For those of you who are from Germany and who may know Pritu Prabhu, he told me a story once in Los Angeles that he met Sting, the famous singer from the band The Police. This goes back to the 19, you know, late 70s and 80s. But in those days, they were a huge band worldwide. Sting, very, I think, talented musician. And so Pritu said, you know, so one day Sting asked me in Ireland, so uh, what is your philosophy? Forgive me for my German, attempted German accent imitation. So Pritu Prabhu told me, so I, I thought for a while, and then I said to him, well, uh, we are spirits in the material world. And if you know, the police, one of their greatest hit songs, which made millions of dollars, was the song called, We Are Spirits in the Material World. We are spirits in the material world. And so Pritu told me, and so I told him this, and he went ahead and did this hit song, which made him millions of dollars. He didn't give me one dollar. <laughs> That's the history behind, behind the, the We Are Spirits in the Material World song. And there's a Mexican, uh, there's a Mexican food preparation called uh, chile, chile con carne. If, um, if the wife of, um, uh, what's his name? Prabhupada disciple who was here, who was a Mexican wife. Um, uh, if Vaidyanath Prabhu and his wife were here, they would... Hmm? Nitya Siddha. Siddha or Sutta. Nitya Siddha. Anyway, there's this Mexican preparation called chili con carne, which is, you know, chili with meat. So there's a, you know, kind of a joke. You can, you know, we are not, we are almas con carne. Alma in Spanish means soul. So <laughs> we are almas, we are souls with meat. You know, we are meat, <laughs> we are almas con carne. Prabhupada in the purport here quotes Bhagavad Gita 14.3. Okay, so, so let's, let's read this verse here together, because that's what, again, comes into this theme of who is the self. So, the verse goes, Mama yonir mahat brahma tasmin garban dadham yaham sambhavak sarva bhutanam tato bhavati bharata. The total material substance, Krishna says, called Brahman. Remember in the Purpur Prabhupada describes how sometimes material nature is also called Brahman. So the total material substance called Brahman, Krishna says, is the source of birth and it is that Brahman that I impregnate, making possible the births of all living beings, O son of Bharata. Right. So again, this idea that there's souls and those souls who reject Krishna, who reject God, are sent, technically via the glands of Lord Shiva, if I'm not mistaken, you know, into the material world. Into the material world. And that's us. That's all living entities, all conscious living beings, whatever stage in their reincarnation cycle they're at, whether in tree bodies or bird bodies or fish bodies or human bodies, they come from a different world. They come from a different reality. They are made of a different stuff than matter. Right? Let me give you one more verse in this connection, which comes from the, this very chapter, just a few verses back. It's really, I think, cool verse, which describes, again, this distinction between the soul and the matter in which the soul is. Um, this is, I think, from verse 7 from this chapter. It goes like this, Karya karana kartritve karanam prakritim vidhu buktritve sukha dukkanam purusham prakriti param. The word purusha is often used in the Bhagavad Gita and refers to who? Mm -mm. The soul, exactly. It can also, of course, refer to, 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 to the Lord, but Many times in the Gita, Krishna uses the word purusha to refer to us as individual souls, the small jivas. And so here's the translation. We just read this maybe when uh, Nara Hari Prabhu was speaking. I think he spoke on this verse. It goes like this. The cause, the cause of the conditioned soul's material body and the senses is material nature. So mother nature, right? The body that we have, it's a product of material nature. 
the feeling of happiness and distress of the soul. So whatever we're experiencing, happiness, distress, you know, karmic reactions that are coming to us. The happiness and distress of the soul, who is transcendental by nature, are caused by the spirit soul himself. So again, the assumption that's assumed here is that there is a soul inside material nature. And, that's, and that soul is responsible for his actions in this material world. And the soul alone is responsible for the reactions of the actions that that soul takes. You know, Jean-Paul Sartre, this, this existentialist French philosopher, who, for whom, you know, Vaishnavas don't have much sympathy at all, that he said, he said one thing that could be twisted in a Vaishnava interpretation. He said that we are thrown into this world and therefore we are the sole responsible, you know, actors. It's nobody's fault in this world but us. We are fully responsible for our life in this world. You know. And that's kind of echoing the words of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita 3.20, which is very similar to this verse and this verse here, that the experience of happiness and distress of the soul is caused by nobody else's but the soul. So the soul is different from matter. Let me read to you the, the conversation between Prabhupada and Karandar and Bhaktisarup Dhamadhar Maharaj. In that book, Life Comes From Life, do you understand this notion of life comes from life? Like, why did Prophet call it life comes from life? I had difficulty grasping what he meant by that. Is anyone, is there, everyone got it? Okay. I, I didn't like, what well, when life comes from life? But my understanding is that, you know, the soul, or God, of course, but the soul is what moves matter. Matter does not move without the presence of the soul. And therefore, life, so-called, you know, mo a moving body, doesn't come from matter. It comes from the actual life inside, the consciousness, the soul, which is impregnated by God into the material world. So this is, this is taking place on Venice Beach, Los Angeles, in the 70s. And Prabhupada is very hard here in this conversation, if you've read it. So Prabhupada says, speaking about the scientists, he says, and I say to them, if life originated from chemicals, and if your science is so advanced, then why can't you create life biochemically in your laboratories? So Karandar says, they say that they will create life in the future. Prabhupada, what future? When this crucial point is raised, they reply, we shall do it in the future. Why in the future? That is nonsense. Trust no future, however pleasant. He quotes this famous saying, you know, don't trust the future, however good it looks. If they are so advanced, they must demonstrate now how life can be created from chemicals. Otherwise, what is the meaning of their advancement? They are talking nonsense. So Karandar Prabhu says, they say they are right on the verge of creating life. Prabhupada. That's only a different way of saying the same thing in the future. The scientists must admit that they still do not know the origin of life. Their claim that they will soon prove a chemical origin of life is something like paying someone with a post-dated check. Suppose I give you a post-dated check for $10,000 but I actually have no money. What is the value of that check? Scientists are claiming that their science is wonderful, but when a practical example is wanted, they say they will provide it in the future. If you are intelligent, um, I'm sorry, suppose I say that I have millions of dollars, and when you ask me for some money, I say, yes, I will give, I will now give you a big post-dated check. Is that all right? If you are intelligent, you will reply, at present, give me at least $5 in cash so I can see something tangible. Similarly, the scientists, not all scientists, you know, the physicalist scientists, because there's a lot of scientists out there who actually believe in God, who actually are devoted to God. 
I mean, the whole, you know, science before this big rupture between science and religion, which many say is caused by the, unfortunately, by the Catholic Church and their fanaticism, before that divorce took place, you know, most science was precisely to try to understand the book of nature. And, you know, today you have a lot of mostly Christian scientists who are trying to, you know, present um, intelligent design, you know, model of the, of, the, of the world or the universe by intelligent design, who are trying to show how it is just mathematically impossible that life could come from matter and so on. But unfortunately, the majority of scientists today are under that physicalist, you know, um, paradigm. So Prabhupada says, Scientists cannot produce even a single blade of grass in their laboratories, yet they claim that life is produced from chemicals. What is this nonsense? Is no one questioning this? So like that, Prabhupada is continuing speaking. You could you know, just look it up in the, um, in the Veda base or online. Coming back to this, you know, children who remember their past lives, if it's true, then that really means that there is a conscious self that survives matter, that really is the main person uh, in matter, and that survives physical death. And it seems that, you know, when you look at, okay, the physicalist paradigm, that's, you know, disqualification. Or in other words, that's out of the question to explain phenomena like this, right? I mean, if, if matter, if, if consciousness, and just like we heard Francis Crick say, if you, your free will, your emotions, your sorrows is just a combination of chemicals in the brain, then who, what is surviving physical death? When physical death happens, when the, you know, the medical... That white line that is awaiting us all. When that white line is there at the end, um, technically the brain is finished. There's no brain activity. There's, you're, the body is literally completely finished, dead. There's no activity whatsoever. And yet, you know, you have cases of people who come back to describe they were clinically dead for like you know ten minutes or two hours, you know. And somehow they come back and they, they speak of, you know, I was, I was hovering above the operation table. And, and they give sometimes very specific details of what this nurse told as a joke to another nurse. Or, you know, what the doctor asked, you know, where's this, you know, scalpel, scalpel number XYZ. Like specific things that went on when they were clinically dead, right? So the physicalist paradigm can't understand it. I can't explain it. And that's why... Coming back to Dhruta Karma Prabhu, one of his main arguments with that he and, and um, Sadaputta Prabhu put forward is that there's this thing called you know knowledge filter happening. The knowledge filter f happening in, in one of the early James Bond movies. The bad guy, he lives in some sort of penthouse apartment over a big sort of indoor pool where there's sharks inside. And the way to go to his office, you go to an elevator, right? And so when he wants to get rid of an enemy, you know, he calls him over, yeah, come over for a drink or whatever. The guy goes into the elevator, and while he's in the elevator, the floor opens completely, and then the poor guy falls in a tunnel down into the swimming pool, and then the sharks devour him. So of course, James Bond, being almost as intelligent as Krishna, knows <laughs> in advance. And so you see the scene of the door opening and the bad guys behind his you know, lacquered wooden desk, assuming that there'll be no one in the elevator because the, the floor has been opened, but James Bond with his feet, you know, cross, cross almost like a ninja against the wall is there and he shoots him, whatever. So why am I mentioning this? Because this, this is analogy is similar to what's happening a lot in academic circles where there's this knowledge filtration. In other words, you have a particular theory and then you have some evidence out there that proves so-called the theory. When some new set of evidence comes up that goes against the accepted theory, a lot of times, in instead of adjusting the theory, 
you get rid of the evidence. You put it under the carpet. Or you have an opening and it goes into a trash can and no one ever hears about it. That's what Druta Karmapu's book is, you know, in, in his book, Forbidden Archaeology. He shows there's, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of archaeological evidence that have been completely suppressed from the, you know, archaeological community because they prove, or they seem to prove, that humans, homo homo sapiens like us, have been existing on Earth for much, 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 much longer than the accepted Darwinian, you know, time scale of human existence. Hundreds of cases of skulls and bones, you know, of anatomically human beings dated to go back hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. And that, you know, for a strict Darwinian, is anathema. It's, it's, oh my God, the computer does not, com because it challenges the very paradigm. For Vaishnavas, no big deal. The Puranas talk about humans existing on Earth, you know, millions of years. In Satya Yuga, previous yugas, I mean, you name it, goes all the way back, right? But, but you know, the idea that humans, like Homo Homo sapiens, like us, have existed on this planet for more than you know maybe fifty thousand years, or what to speak of two hundred thousand, or five hundred thousand, or what to speak of millions or hundreds of millions, is is just too much cognitive dissonance. So, swipe it under the carpet, right? Swipe it under the carpet. So yeah, so the physicalist paradigm doesn't work, and then you know when you do a quick, a quick look at other models that may explain this claim that we make based on, for example, study of you know children who claim to remember their past lives. I don't find other models satisfying these phenomena as well as the Vaishnava model. You know, in Hebrew 9.20, with all the respect to all the wonderful expressions of devotion that we find in the Christian world, no doubt, amazing expressions of, of bhakti, still, you know, the main scripture, with all the respect, 9.27 of Hebrew, for example, says, you know, just as people are destined to live once, and after that, face judgment. You, you only live once. And also, the, this is very... This idea that we find, you know, at least theoretically, very clear. Okay, we are 100% soul and 0% physical body and mind. You don't find that very often in the Christian world. I remember a quick story. When my father died, I asked the priest, because my brother is Catholic, practicing Catholic, and he wanted to, my father was not so religious, but my, father, my brother insisted to have a, a funeral, a Catholic funeral. So I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of a priest or a pastor, if you want to use a Protestant term. And yeah, I'm the only one in the family who kind of takes God seriously. So I should, you know, it's my father. I should speak. But I didn't want to, you know, do something crazy. So I asked. I had a meeting with the, with, the, with the priest of the church. And I said, listen, I'd like to speak about, I'd like to quote a few verses from the Bhagavad Gita talking about the eternality of the soul, how the soul is eternal. Hmm? Something that Christians could say, okay, that also fits in our scripture. And actually, with all due respect to my brother, he was the one who was against it. And the priest was also against it. And so, the day of the funeral, our, bo our father's body is in the coffin, the open coffin, everyone's kind of sad. And then, you know, neither, neither me nor my brother, because I told my brother, okay, well, if, if I'm, if I'm not going to speak, you're not going to speak. So, you know, a, a quarrel. So, the priest of the church comes and he says, and this is interesting, he says, you know, we have learned from the Greeks, as if, you know, as if theology starts with the Greeks. Anyway, we have learned from the Greeks that the soul is eternal. But we as Catholics, we do accept that the body is intrinsically part of our identity to a certain degree. And that's why you, you, know, you have this famous saying which has so much infiltrated the DNA of Western civilization, you know, what is it? Body, mind, and spirit. Right? You hear that all over. But, and that actually comes from, just so you know, from a little letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonians. I hope that you are all well, waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ in body, mind, and, and spirit. So, like, there's this, you know, okay, I, I have a soul, but I am also part body. You know, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of resurrection, you know, the bodies of human beings will, you know, in their self-same bodies, go back. But, but, but in, in Bhagavad Gita, you know, or in, in the Vedic knowledge, aham brahmasmi, we are 100%, you know, souls. 
And then one sentence about you know Zen Buddhism, it's anatma. It's an, you know they openly say we believe we are the doctrine of anatma. There is no atma. There is no soul. So okay, then who reincarnates? Their, their notion of you know discovering who the next Dalai Lama is is very kind of difficult to understand if you don't accept the individual soul's existence. Because then who is getting the karma if there's no individual self who is responsible for the actions in one body? You know. And by definition, you know, anatma, well then, you know, how do you... So that doesn't fit. Um, anyway, it's not so fair, so, so fair to you know, describe every world religion in one sentence, but for the Vaishnavas, the one that's kind of closest, that would accept this notion of, you know, we are not the body, is the Advaita Vedanta school. The Mayavadis, as Prabhupada would call them. And there... You know, there's this idea, yeah, yeah, you know, the body is temporary, it's not really, it's not who we are, but consciousness is the real thing. But here, you know, it's consciousness in the sense of just Brahman, in the spiritual sense of Brahman. We're all one, and it's just this white light, this white divine consciousness, and somehow it's been, you know, separated into different bodies, and because of ego, we are thinking we're individuals, but when, this is so famous in India, isn't it? This idea of moksha, 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 moksha is the prime goal of life. But for Vaishnavas, mm -mm. moksha is a byproduct of bhakti. Ah, it's true. I mean, I, I, sorry for putting on a slight accent. I just came back from India. But the devotees, the Vaishnavas, understand or believe that each soul is an individual purusha, an individual jiva, and even after moksha. Even after moksha, that individual soul remains individual. And so you may say, well, how and what? What does that individual soul do? This is where the description of Goloka Vrindavan and Vaikuntha come into, peace, into place. And this is where the notion of rasa comes into place. Where every jiva has a swarup, an individual relationship with the supreme being, with the supreme person, Krishna or Vishnu or Nishingadev. <laughs> And that individual, that relationship is individual. And that theory is milked, <laughs> if I may say, to a, to, a, to a very, very, very sophisticated degree, accompanied by amazing testimonies. For example, you have the story of Raghunath Das Goswami. First of all, many of our acharyas have revealed in their writings who they are, who they are spiritually. Right? Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur claims in one of his writings, he's a manjari, he's a, his eternal, his, he as a jiva is the eternal form of a young gopi or young manjari in, go in the spiritual world, way beyond matter. See, this is something that the Advaita Vedantas can never even conceive of. The idea of swarup, spiritual form, individual souls having individual form and relating as persons with a supreme person or a supreme couple, Radha Krishna. Huh? So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur also revealed his swarup. Prabhupada never revealed his swarup. Also, some people you know, claim that he did sometimes kind of indirectly point to the swarup of a, of, a, of a coward boy. You know, in that prayer on Prabhupada, on the Jaladuta, when he arrives in America, he, he has this meditation where, ah, I long to roll on the ground with you, my, my, my Lord, and play in the pasturing grounds. How much I long for that. You know? But then you have these amazing stories of, like, for example, it's mentioned in, 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 in the Goswami literature or, or Chaitanya Charitamrita, like Raghunath Das Goswami, who we know was very austere. He only ate like a little bit of butter, you know, buttermilk every three days. And one day, according to the hagiographies, he had this uh, indigestion symptoms. And they called the Kaviraj. Satyaraj Prabhu mentions that book in the book on the six Goswamis. So they call the Kaviraj, the Kaviraj takes his pulse, and he says, oh, this man is suffering from indigestion. All the Goswamis of Vrindavan start laughing, <laughs> like, hello, do you know who this is? He eats a little bit of buttermilk every three days. How can he be suffering from indigestion? And then Raghunath Das Goswami humbly, almost shamefully, excuse me, admits, well, actually, in the spiritual world, there was a big feast, and I overate in my swarup. Right? In, in a so here you have like this, you, have, you know how like in children who remember their past lives, sometimes when a, 
uh, someone is killed, let's say, for example, with a shot of a, of a, of a bullet, in the next body, you see sometimes the birthmark of the entrance of the bullet and coming out by darker pigmentation of the skin in front and back. So in an extreme sense, you have something that's happening to the spiritual body of a jiva, and it's manifesting in matter. Also, Srinivasacharya is mentioned, right? He, he, found, he, he got a garland from, from the spiritual world, and it manifests in the material world. That story uh, where he in his manjari form is, is being told by an assistant of Radharani, please help me find Radharani's bangle. It's, it's lost in this kunda. And so in the material world, right, Srinivasacharya goes into deep meditation for like three days, and his wives are like flipping out. He's going to die, he's, you know. And so they call... Um, Shamananda Pandit, with whom he's really good friends. And they call him and say, Shamananda, you know, our, our Prabhu is about to die. And so Shamananda looks and says, no, no, don't worry, he's in Samadhi. Because meanwhile, in the spiritual world, in his manjari form, he's swimming in this kund, trying to find the earring, I think, or a bangle of Srimati Radharani, as described. But time is different, right, in the spiritual world and in the material world. So this Shamananda Pandit is described. He sits right next to Srinivasacharya, closes his eyes, and also... And he also has an eternal form of a manjari. And he enters that same pastime, and he dives into that kund, and finds the bangle under a lotus leaf, and gives it to Srinivasacharya in his manjari form, who then comes out of the water, gives it to Lalita, and Lalita gives it, you know, puts it on Radharani just as she's about to leave. And at that moment, both Srinivasacharya and Shamananda, in their physical bodies, wake up, and they look at each other and they just go, they laugh and laugh and embrace each other and cry. What, what other tradition in the world describes, you know, personalism as, you know, individual jivas having that type of, of pers eternal personality, like Gaudiya Vaishnavism, you know. So, to conclude, My advice, my dear devotees, don't fall for the fake news. And I'm speaking to myself here. Don't fall, you know, victim to the to the fake news. And this, you know, when I'm talking about fake news, is here, you know, is this propaganda that you're the body, right? You are in the right place in terms of worldview. You know, everybody wants to be on a winning team. You're on the winning team of of worldviews of how to explain, you know, existence. And you're in the right you're in the right place. Just stay there, right? And the more you just continue chanting Hare Krishna every day and, and worshiping the deity and offering your fruit to Krishna and serving the Vaishnavas and reading Srimad Bhagavatam and helping others come to Krishna, the more our scriptures say that realization will actually become realized. That realization will become a realization in your life. So to finish, I wanted you to repeat after me a verse, two, two prayers from the soul who is inside the body of the mother, as described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's a passage, I think it's in the third canto, right? Right? Where, where the, there's the, the, the soul inside the body before it's about to come out of the mother's womb. He has a moment of lucidity and he realizes his horrible situation and he prays to, to Krishna. So, please repeat after me. I have a body in which I can control my senses and I can understand my destination. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord by whom I have been blessed with this body and by whose grace I can see Him within and without. Therefore, without being agitated anymore, I shall deliver myself from the darkness of nations with the help of my friend, clear consciousness, simply by keeping the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu in my mind, I shall be saved from entering into the wombs of many mothers for repeated birth and death. 
So before f the last word, any comment or question? I went on the purple. Expose. So, what? Yeah. What? What would? How is your point of view? How far should exposition? Well, I think that all devotees, whether they're you know scientifically inclined or not, by their very lifestyle, by their very example in society, without even opening a word th their mouth, they are opposing that that paradigm. I think it was Saint Francis or something. He said, you know, preach your whole life, and sometimes speak. <laughs> so by, by their own example, devotees, you know, even if they're not intellectuals or science, scientifically inclined by their guna and karma, are already you know, opposing that paradigm. No, excuse me, I, I, I don't eat meat, or no, I, I, you know, I refuse to have illicit sex, or you know, why, I mean, right? And then for those, so I think it depends on the devotees. Some devotees are inclined to challenge and to have some sort of you know, scientific mindset and they go all the way to get PhDs in biomolecular chemistry and join the Bhaktivedanta Institute and write books and and so on. But I think essentially all devotees just by their decision to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of God are living oppositions to that paradigm. And then some do it maybe a little specifically as a mission more than others. Yeah? So, Prabhus, we're lucky. We're lucky to be at the shelter of Prabhupada. We're lucky to be at the shelter of the Bhagavatam. We should be grateful to, um, to have the chance to chant Hare Krishna. We should be happy that we have a, a healthy, a relatively healthy body, at least healthy enough to turn on to YouTube and listen to the Bhagavatam or to be in the class and, and listen and, and to chant Hare Krishna tomorrow morning and this evening. And we should just, you know, try our best to continue to stay in the association of devotees and just continue this practice of bhakti yoga as, as given to us by Prabhupada. And, uh, and yeah, and be examples. Be examples to, uh, to the world, imperfect as we are, of souls who are you know, really trying, or let's say people who are really trying to live in this world as if they are souls. With this cherished belief that it's not just you know, some soul in a generic sense, but that we all have an eternal relationship with, 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 with a, a wonderful person personal God who has amazing qualities and everything from, you know, beauty to, to good humor to compassion to the infinite degree and with whom we can, you know, start to have a relationship in this life, in this embodied existence and with whom our scriptures say we'll have, you know, we'll re we will reunite after leaving our bodies. Thank you, Prabhu's. Shila Vrindavan Das Thakur Ki Jai Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Nishinga Dev Ki Jai